We were looking at the church in Philadelphia two weeks ago. We weren't finished with that. And so we'll finish up with that and then jump forward to the church in Laodicea. I actually went back, tried to go back over the video that I had made and do know that I think we're up to date with all the videos. If you go to the Facebook and to Alexandria First Baptist Church, hopefully you'll see uh, the Bible studies on there as well as sermons. So if you miss one, hopefully, hopefully I didn't miss putting one up there. Although I will admit I put September 13th on there today. So my apologies on that one. And I tried to go back and I was watching it. I was like, where were we? So I'm, I'm saying we're probably around verse 9. I don't think we got very far in it. We're in Revelation chapter 3 in verse 9. We read, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. It's these people who are saying that they're Jews, but instead they're, they're really serving God's enemies, and, and they're persecuting the Christians. And it, it really in some ways could be very similar to what we do in the church. It's... It happens in churches where the church, people in the church persecute others in the church uh, for whatever reason. They don't like them. They did something that they don't like. There's some issue going on, whatever it is, and we can easily do that to one another. Uh, and, that's, and to me, that's sin. And these, these are people who were, who were imitating Jews. They, they were getting inside, and, and yet they were persecuting the Christians. And what I found interesting, because at first, the first time I read this, and sometimes, you know, if you read Scripture fast, sometimes you miss a word, and something just doesn't sound right, and you have to stop and go back. And when I read through this, it says, I will make them come and bow down before your feet. And the first time I read this, it was they were going to bow down at his feet. And I, I missed that, your feet. And so imagine your enemies having to come in and, and actually bow down at your feet. How humbling is that? How, I mean, think about how difficult it sometimes is to say you're sorry to someone. To go up to someone and say, hey, you know what, I, you know, would you forgive me? I, I, I messed up. I did something wrong. And imagine these people who are against the Christians going in now and, and having to bow down at their feet and come to the recognition that Christ loves them. That's humiliating. And, and that's really the call because they're, put, they're puffing themselves up. They're acting like they've got all the answers and this, at the same time they're persecuting the Christians and this is what is going to happen to them. And it's pretty humiliating when that happens, and they learn that Christ loves them. And, and he goes on in verse 10, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. There's... A couple of different views on this, on this passage. It's, on the one hand, as we read this, here's the commendation. You've kept my word. You have patiently endured. But tribulation's coming. And it's going to happen while you're in this world. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. So some people read into that that they are going to be taken before the time of tribulation comes so that they will not have to face that. And so, the, so some have this 
pre-tribulation rapture position that tells them that this verse is signifying to them that Christ will take them out of the world before that literal great tribulation begins. Others, on the other side of it, believe that Christ will protect them. They will not have to face tribulation, but they will be there during the tribulation. So as you see, you can read one passage and have two very different kinds of views of what interpreters, how interpreters look at that one verse. I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. It doesn't say they're going to be taken away, but that they will be protected. I'll keep you from that hour of trial. So there's a couple of different views that people have regarding that, that that hour of trials, they won't be there because they will have been taken up in the rapture, and others who view it as, well, they'll still be there, but they're going to be protected, and they will not have to endure any trials or any tribulations, but the non-believers will have to face those trials and tribulations. He says, I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Again, that image of hold fast is, is really holding on. I, I think a couple weeks ago I used the image from the movie Twister where at the very end Helen Hunt and whoever the guy was are holding on to some pipes and they're hold, you know, hold on, don't let go. <laughs> because if you don't let go, what we hear, hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Your crown, that, that's your faith. That, that is, that is your, your place that you have in the kingdom. So hold on. Don't give up. Be an overcomer. Remember, every church is told to be an overcomer or to be a conqueror. And so he says, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple. What, what's a pillar? When you think about a pillar, you're thinking of something that holds something up, something that holds, that is strong, something that has power. Because if you, know, you think about a pillar that's holding up a key room in your house, and you say, you know, I'd like to make an addition here, but so we're just going to knock out this pillar, and we don't know that it's really holding anything up. And you realize that one single pillar was doing a lot of work. And so, so the image is that they are going to be pillars, that they're going to have power, have stability, that they are the cornerstone. And he, and he says, never... You'll be, in the, you'll be a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my, my own new name. So you, they, they receive that crown. There's, there's the pillar that, that's signifying their strength. They're going to be in the temple, which implies a prominent place, a prominent service that they're going to have, that they are the overcomer, and they're identified with the name of God, and they're going to hear the new name in the new Jerusalem. And so it's the appearance that they're going to have the full revelation of who Christ is. It's not going to be hidden. You'll have this full revelation of Jesus because they're the overcomers, because they were the ones who held on, they held fast, and they were the ones who didn't have any negatives actually against them in the church in Philadelphia, unlike the final church that we get to look at. And I guess they saved the worst for last. And so we'll move on to verse 14 in the church of Laodicea. The church in Laodicea, just like the church in Philadelphia, was damaged by the earthquake in AD 60. And the church in Philadelphia sought Roman help to do all the repairs that they needed. The church in Laodicea believed that they were self-sufficient, and they didn't want any help. 
they thought they had it made. They were a prosperous church. Uh, the city didn't see it as poor. Uh, they were, uh, they had a lot going for it. There was, Laodicea was at a, a crossroads and uh, there was a lot of commerce that traveled through there. Um, they were very rich in minerals. They had a, uh, a big stadium. So there was a lot of wealth. They were known for three main things. They were known for their aqueducts. They were known for, for medicine, uh, which was an eye ointment, a, a salve. And they were known for their banking. And they were also known for their fine linens. And the writer, John, is going to play off of those a little bit later as we read in this. And so, so when we think about this church in Laodicea, uh, they're known for some stuff. They were considered one of the wealthiest cities in, in the region. And because of that, they didn't want any help when they had that earthquake. There's no words of praise. This is the only church where there's absolutely no words of praise to the church. All the other churches, the other six churches, had some word of praise, something that they were commended for. But they have no praise for the church in Laodicea. So we start out, and to the church, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And so we see the, the faithful and true witness. He's the true one. In the Greek, what, what does the word Amen, what does the word Amen mean? True. It's true. When Jesus said, you know, truly, truly, I say to you, he was saying, amen. You know, we end, when we end a prayer and, you know, we all say, you know, we all say, amen. We're, we're saying, it is true. It's kind of, kind of an echo of what the prayer is. We say, amen, it's true. So, amen simply means true. And so Jesus is saying, I am the true one. I am the amen. I'm the faithful and the true witness. And that kind of juxtaposes the church because the church was faithless. There really wasn't a faith. They were inconsistent. He says, he is the beginning of God's creation. And, and some people will read into that. Well, he's the, first, he's the first creation of God. And that's not what it really says. If you actually read the literal Greek, the literal Greek would say, he begins the creation of God. He's the one who is the author of creation. He's not the first created one, which would go into um, heretical theology. So Jesus is the one who began God's creation. He is not the first one who was created. And so he says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. They were lukewarm. I mean, let me just finish this in verse 16. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Have you ever wanted, on a hot day, a cold glass of water, a cold lemonade, a cold iced tea? I don't. And you go and and all there is. I mean, we always have bottled water. I mean, it's kind of the thing in our world today. I grew up. There's no such thing as bottled water. But there's always bottled water in the refrigerator. But sometimes there's not. And you want that cold drink of water, and you go and say, oh, I guess I'll just open up this water bottle that's kind of lukewarm. Nothing like a lukewarm bottle of water on a hot day when you've been outside. And you want to spit it out. I love hot coffee. And I can't tell you, I mean, if Kelly was here, she'd tell you how many times she hears the microwave in a day. Because I get to work, and I'm doing something, I go take a drink. That's how I get my exercise, walk from my office to the microwave. Because I want hot coffee. I mean, lukewarm just doesn't cut it for me. 
Think about when you eat something, you don't want lukewarm, generally, I mean, unless it's a baby. You want cold or you want hot. You want, you want when you're with someone, you want passion. You don't want someone who's, who has no emotion. These people weren't cold, which could be refreshing. They weren't hot, which could bring healing. They, they were nothing. And you think, about, you think about life in the church. You think about how the church functions. You th think about, don't even think about how the church functions. Think about yourself. Think about our own spirit. Because the church is a reflection of ourselves. Think about when we're lukewarm. We're not cold. Jesus says, I'd rather you be one or the other. I'd rather you be something, stand for something. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and you don't know where they stand in the end? I mean, it's kind of, I don't want to say they're like a politician because I don't want to be insulting to politicians, but that's kind of what we say. And it's like, I don't even know what they believe. And they kind of dance around faith. When you have an atheist who says, they're more apt to say, yeah, I don't believe. They're just right up front with it. But we're not. We, we kind of dance around. And Jesus is saying, show me who you are. And the question come, comes to our own spirit. Who am I? What is it I show? What is it you show? What is it we show together? How, how do we come here on a Wednesday night, on a Sunday morning? Uh, again, kind of, kind of, you know, do we bring our, all that baggage in with us and, and bring it in, put it aside for an hour, take it back up, or, or even just keep the baggage during, during a worship? What do we show one another? What do we show the world? What is God when he looks at us? Because, you know, there's nothing hidden from him. He knows our hearts. Uh, to me, that's... I'll, I'll be honest, that is probably the scariest thing for me. I can hide from Kenny. I can. I could hide from any of you. I can go in my home and I, I could sin all I want and you don't know it. And I think, oh, I got away with it. Kenny doesn't know. But God always knows. I can't, you cannot go anywhere and hide. And on, on the other hand, it's a great thing because God's always going to be with me. He promises that he's not going to fail me. He's not going to forsake me. He's always with me. So it's, it's a great, great thing that we have from God. But what do we show? What do we show one another? What, what, what are we hiding? Are we cold? Are, are we cold towards God? God, you know, uh, it's all a show. Or am I hot? Am I on fire? Kind of like Jeremiah says, I am so on fire that, that my bones would, would just wither because I have to yell out, I have to speak out my love for God. You know, what are we at? And God says, I, you know, if you don't stand for anything, you stand for nothing. And it's one of those passages where you know, when Jesus said, well, if you're not for me, you're against me. And you think about that. Well, if I'm not for him, well, I'm really not against him. I'm just kind of the middle of the road. I'm kind of this lukewarm. But if you're not for him, then you're not on his side. You're not on that side of the fence. And so you're not going to encourage. You're not going to have that passion. And so... So he just says, you guys are all lukewarm. And see, what the author is doing, what John is doing, is he's playing off of the region. Because you see, in Laodicea, there, there was a, a hot spring that was five miles away. And it brought water down to the city. And do you know that hot spring, by the time it got to Laodicea, do you know what the temperature was? It was lukewarm. 
So they fully, so you see, we don't know that. We don't catch that word picture in the whole story. But they had these, and they had walls where the water would come down that was filled with lime and that you couldn't, you couldn't drink it because, because of all the, the stuff that was in it. And, and so if you wanted to do something, no, that's lukewarm. So that, that's what John is playing off of, that the water was lukewarm. You have all this stuff. You are so wealthy. But your water is pretty rotten. In fact, your water is an indicator of who you are. You're lukewarm. You don't have passion for Christ. You know, sometimes, sometimes people say, well, do you remember when you first believed, how excited you were? And, and sometimes, sometimes there's people who, when they first came to believe in Jesus, there wasn't this, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm saved and I've got salvation and I'm all, I'm all freaked out and I'm all excited and I'm all passionate because it was just a steady, and, and I'm one of those, it was just a steady progression. It was a very logical decision for me. And so sometimes, oh, do you remember that day? Well, no, I really, I don't remember that day, number one, and a lot of people don't. But over time, we kind of forget. Life's going okay. I, there's no needs. There's no needs. There's no needs until the major need comes. And then, uh, God, where are you? I need to pray. The call to me is to be hot for God, to be passionate all the time. It's to take that time out of the day and to pray. It's to take that time out to read. It's, I'm not talking about taking four hours a day, but it's a little bit of time where we focus on God, we focus on our relationship with Him, so that we can grow, so that we can stay hot, so we can stay passionate, instead of being cold towards God or lukewarm towards God. And God would prefer you be cold because He knows where you stand. When you're lukewarm, you know, He knows where you stand, but we don't know where each other stands. We kind of play the game. And that's why sometimes I'll joke that I never, I never, never go to the store and buy Laodicean coffee because it's always lukewarm. Okay, that's my one joke of the night. And it was a bomb. So they were half-hearted in, in their approach. And no one really likes people who are half-hearted. You know, in coaching football, Wednesdays and Thursdays are our hardest days where it's full hitting. Mondays and Tuesdays, Mondays is our helmets only, Tuesdays helmets and shoulder pads and hitting but only above the waist. And Wednesday and Thursday, it's just all out tackling. And yet Coach and I were talking today, it's like, you know, sometimes we take it easy. We don't practice well. And just looking at it and, you know, And if, if you've ever coached, if you've ever been coached by someone, they, they'll tell you, well, how you practice, that's how you're going to play. How do we practice? How do we practice in private so that we're ready for the game? Let's go back to Hebrews 12, what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and 3, when we're told to run with endurance the race that has been set before us. You can't do it lukewarm. You've got to go hard. So it's that same image of continuing on, continuing on. And so Jesus says, I'm, I'll spit you out. I don't want you. If you're lukewarm, I'm just spitting you out because you're no good. You're not, you're not worth anything. John then says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy, to buy me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. You see, he's using all that they have against them. Those are all that they were known for. You see, they say that they're rich and that they've prospered. And so here's the irony that you have for the Laodiceans. 
they're not really rich. They're spiritually bankrupt. They're spiritually poor. Their lukewarmness makes them poor. Despite their overflowing banks, John says, you're poor. Despite their, all their physicians and their medicines and that great eye ointment they have, he says, you're blind. Despite their clothing factories and the great linens that they make, he says, but you're naked. And so in truth, they're wretched. They're pitiable. And so he says, I'm looking, I'm, I went back looking at Philadelphia. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. He wants the, what, what would the white garment symbolize? Purity. The purity. Put on the white, get the gold that's refined by God's fire because that's going to be pure. Get the white garments as a sign of purity. It's going to cover your nakedness. Can remember, remember in that day, I mean, unlike today, there, you didn't show yourself. You were very respectful. You were covered. Women were covered. Men were covered. It was indecent. That's the part of the beauty of the story of the prodigal son. When, when the father runs down that lane to greet his son, no Arabic father, and I mean Arabic meaning a Jewish father as well, would run. They're not going to run in their robe. They're not going to run down that lane to greet their child. That was shameful. It was embarrassing. And so you have that image of the father running. It's the same image here. You, you have to cover up that nakedness. You don't show anything. You don't, you know, you, to, for that father to have run, he literally would have to have pulled up his robe so that he could run without tripping on him over his robe. You wouldn't do that. So that's the image that John is trying to portray for us. And that they would have that eye ointment, that salve, and it would cure them from their blindness. Because the, the goal for them was to be able to see, to truly see who Christ is, to not be embarrassed, to not be humiliated. And, and if you look at it, on the one hand, at the beginning, he talks about the rich. He says, for you say I am rich in verse 17. And now in verse 18, he's saying to buy from me, buy from God, gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich. So, so on the one hand, they're saying, oh, we've got all this money. We're wealthy. We've got this great commerce. We've got these banks. We're at the junction of three major um, traveling intersections. So, so we've got a lot of trade, the commerce. The, it's a boom economy. And John's saying, you're spiritually bankrupt. You have all the money in the world, but you're spiritually bankrupt. Did, did you hear what was going on in the college basketball world? All the money that's, that's been passed on, how uh, supposedly this guy from, they say it, they, they're an unnamed school, but everyone knows the school and everyone knows the player from Louisville, uh, was given $100,000 from Adidas to go to Louisville. It was a kid who, was, who had never said, I'm going to go to Louisville. I'm never going to, he never said, I'm not going to go to Louisville. All of a sudden, at the end of May and June, oh, I think I'm going to go to Louisville. It's because $100,000 got slipped into his hands. Oh, he was rich. $100,000, that's not a bad payday for a kid going to college. And the goal was that he was then, see, they were getting him to go to, this sounds really crazy, he was going to go to an Adidas branded college because everything at Louisville is Adidas. If you go to another school, maybe USC, I don't know what school, it's going to be Nike. 
And the goal, because this guy was a five-star recruit, he's one of the top kids, when he goes pro, he's going to sign with certain agents who are already listed, and he's going to sign with Adidas. And that's how it's all working out. And so the coach, Patino, and the athletic director both got put on leave, whatever that means. I mean, he's weathered a storm at every school he's gone to. And, but you talk about, and Patino says, I know nothing about this. This is just terrible. That Really? You don't know how you got this five-star recruit? Really? Well, that, then what happens is, then you don't have control over your program. Patino makes probably six million a year. Wealthy, but bankrupt at the same time. And if you like college basketball, probably the NCAA finals this year, you might have uh, Anderson University against Taylor University. <laughs> because the ramifications of what happens, you're going to have guys who are going to roll because they don't want prison time. So all of a sudden, you're going to get all these guys who are saying, well, you know, well, Barbara did this, and, and here, here's a tape I had with, when I had a conversation with Sharon, and oh, it's going to be, it's going to get ugly. Uh, if, you're, if you're a basketball fan, March Madness might not be the same this year. Well, because you would, the gold is, is the word, the gold is the relationship you're going to have with Christ. And so you want that because, again, here's the difference. The verse before you say, I am rich, but you're wretched and pitiable. But now you get God's gold. You get the Spirit of God because that's pure. It's been refined by fire. It's 100% pure. And now you're going to be rich. So, so it's kind of like you have to die so that you could live, one of those strange statements that we have. And that's what was true for them. You're going to have to die to yourself so that you could live for Christ. So you think about what, what's going on for them. Think about what goes on for us. Think about our world. Think about, you know, here's this huge bribery deal in the NCA, but let's, t you know, take it closer to home and, and look at all the stuff that goes around Madison County and Grand County and all around us and, and the stuff that goes on in our own personal lives. Where again, we portray to the world, oh, I'm rich, I've got no needs. And yet we're hurting on the inside. And so it's that same thing that comes to us. And, and then you look and you see what he says in verse 19 which really goes into what we're going to talk about on Sunday in Hebrews 12. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. And so God's words, I mean, those are hard words. You know, just like a loving father, a loving mother. Sometimes you have to discipline your children. Sometimes if you're if you're babysitting, if you're doing something for someone, you know, even as a coach, sometimes, you know, there's some kids, not on the high school team, but other kids who are involved in the program who uh, they're just acting up and acting out and, uh, and somehow it got thrown to the high school coaches to have to take care of them. And I got an email today from the football coach saying, if you're working with these boys and they act up, send them to me. I had one coach who had them doing something today. He said, I would just make them run hundreds all day. Just to kind of give them some discipline. You guys keep acting up. This is the consequences. We do it in football. Every time someone jumps offside, doesn't matter if it's the offense or the defense, it's 10 push-ups for the whole team. Kenny could go offside, doesn't matter. We're all doing it. It's the discipline. You're going to have to pay for it. So, 
She says, if I love you, I'm going to reprove you. I I'm going to discipline you. So be zealous. Be, be, and the word zealous is a word. It's to have fire, to have passion. It's not, so it's really, I mean, think about it. It's kind of a strange way to think about it. When he says, be zealous and repent. It's almost like, you know, if you're going to repent, it's kind of like I'm going to walk over to Kenny and like, be meek and, oh, Kenny, I'm sorry. The, the zeal, be zealous and repent is like, zoom, run over to Kenny. Run over, and he said, run over to God. Run to God. Be, be passionate about, be excited about running over back to God and say, God, I messed up. Would you forgive me? God, not, not just forgive me, but give me the strength, give me the wisdom, give me the know-how to turn from what I've done so that I wouldn't do it again and continue to provide me so that I don't do it again and again and again. That's what, I mean, again, go back to the beginning where I talked about we don't like to go over where it said to, that the people from Philadelphia in the synagogue of Satan, that they would have to bow before your feet. The humiliation. We don't like to apologize. We don't like to ask for forgiveness. But here, what John's saying, be zealous and repent. Because God, God loves you. You're his child. You are holy. Colossians 3, you are holy and dearly loved. He chose you out of all the possible people in this creation. He chose you. And he loves you. What a great gift. And so, not that we want to run over to God and say, hey, God, I screwed up again. But that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Fall at his, fall at his feet. Humble ourselves. And repent. And then God says, and it's one of the great passages. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Man, you repent and then here's the opportunity. You now bring yourself back into a relationship. He knocks at the door and waits for you to respond. Think about the Spirit always knocking, always knocking. Michael, come on. Are you really going to do that again, Michael? Stop, Michael. Don't do it. Don't go there. Don't say that. Don't, don't be angry. Don't be bitter. Watch how you portray yourself. Go on and on and on. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, and this is to the believers, if, if you open the door, and to me this is one of the most beautiful parts of the passage. If you open the door, I'm going to come in. And again, John could have simply said, if you open the door, I will come in and eat with you. Wouldn't that be cool? To me, that would be cool. God said, hey, I'm going to come eat with you, Michael. And be like me calling Kenny and saying, hey, Kenny, what would you make for lunch today? I'm going to come over and I'm going to eat with you. We're going to go to Lincoln Square, right? Well, you Okay, that's all right. But listen to what God says. He says, I'm going to come in and eat with you and you with me. That, 
Yeah, but that's, that's, I, I'm actually, I mean, that just kind of, I'll admit it, just kind of got me tearful. Just as a rem- just as a rem- I know that verse, I've quoted it how many times in worship. But to stop and think, that's what God wants to do. He doesn't want to just come in and eat with you. He wants you, he wants me, to eat with him. Think about that fellowship. Think about that community that God wants from us. It's what he wanted for that church in Laodicea. It's what he wants for us. Come. Come and eat. Open the door. Let's eat together. You're going to eat with me, and I'm going to eat with you. And that's a shared fellowship. It's not, it's not a one way. It's two ways. We're doing it together. And that's the image I really believe that God wants us to have, that we do it together. I don't have to do it by myself. I don't have to say, okay, God, you can come and eat with me. No, Michael, I don't want to just eat with you. I want you to eat with me. It's very subtle. But to me, it's amazingly powerful of what God wants. And when you think about it, he wants this for every one of us. It's part of his love. He loves us so much that he would send his son for us so that we could have this opportunity, so that we could eat with him. We could sit down, we eat with him, and he would eat with us. And we would laugh and we would celebrate because I believe there's much laughter that we miss in the Bible. And it would be a celebration. And he says, if you do that, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So there will be some day when we have that opportunity because we've turned, because we're no longer lukewarm, because we're passionate about Christ, because we've been zealous and we've repented and we've had the white garment and we've had the eye ointment and we're no longer naked. And when God says, hey, let me come and eat with you and you with me. And we've said yes. There will come that day that will have the victor's crown. You know, we get to sit with him. You know, just it kind of, when I read that, it kind of reminds me of those old days when I'd have two little boys sitting on my lap. And not that I'm, ne- not that I'm necessarily going to sit on God's lap, but I kind of have that on my daddy's lap, in my daddy's chair. He's going to... You know, I don't know if you ever had anyone kind of say, hey, scooch over a little bit. And you kind of scooch over and they squeeze in next to you. And it's like, yeah, I can kind of picture that. Because it's a picture of intimacy. And we, we, sometimes we say, eh, hold off on the intimacy stuff. But it's powerful intimacy that we will have with Christ. We can have it here, but what it's going to be like in eternity, it's going to be be beyond our wildest dreams. And so he ends in verse 22, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the same is true for us as well. If you have ears to hear, then hear the message of Christ. Not just to turn to him and say, oh yeah, I believe in you. But to not be lukewarm. To let go of whatever it is that holds us back. Because what holds us back stops us from really being hot, passionate, zealous. And we let all that sin. Again, you guys are going to get tired of Hebrews 12 because I'm going to keep throwing it out there. But 
of the sin that clings so closely, the sin that ensnares us, that it easily entangles us. Get rid of it. Because if you get rid of all that baggage, then what do we have? We have Christ alone. And we've been refined by the fire. And we, be, we come to Christ as we are, pure. That's how he sees us. We were created. We're made whiter than snow because we've repented. So, that's it. Oh, what? what? Uh, back in that, 12. 12? Yeah. It says, and I will write upon him my new name. So we each one receive a new name. And. And I will write on him the name of my God. Is that what you're saying? And that's, that's where we will have such intimacy that nothing will be hidden. We'll know Christ fully. Okay. All right. We are just about at 7.30. And next week, oh, I guess we're done with Revelation now. No, I'm just joking. Now we get to move into the, the nitty-gritty, the more fun, get into all the imagery and start to get there. So uh, next week we'll start on Revelation chapter 4. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thanks, Lord, that we could be here. We could uh, learn more about you. Lord, uh, more than just, again, just having... Bible knowledge and Bible trivia. Help us, Lord, to give up the sinful ways that we have. Help us, Lord, to be refined by your fire. It's never fun. It is. Sometimes it feels like we're being disciplined. Sometimes it feels like we're being pruned. But after you're pruned, there comes a time of growth. And so help us to be willing to let go of all that holds us back so we could fully worship you. We could celebrate you. Lord, thanks for your word. Thanks for the way it instructs us, helps us. Let us show the world truly who you are. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Thank you. <laughs>